Book of Esther has the longest verse in the Bible. Chapter 8, verse 9. That verse is 75 words. It's, it's just the opposite of Jesus wept. <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. So, interesting things. Just I always find, try to find things I enjoy listening and remembering. In the book of Esther, hopefully everybody has their Bibles open at this point in time. It mentions who the king was, and that was Ahasuerus. But it also, if you have the footnotes, who else, what was the other name for Ahasuerus? Xerxes. Way back when I started off with Ezra, we talked about the lineage and the, and the fact of Darius, Osiris to begin with, and then Darius, and Darius' son was Xerxes. He also had another, I mean, that's interesting in the book of Esther because we get to hear and see the different names they actually had. Um, in this situation, it talks about how many years had Ahasuerus been king at the point of the first chapter. Third year of his reign, you see in verse 3. And he decided after three years, he was going to have a feast. And then what he did is he invited all the other political individuals and high muckety-mucks or whatever to come to a huge feast. Now, this is a feast bigger than I've ever heard of. A feast that lasted half a year. 180 days, it says in the verses here. Uh, verse 4. He wanted to show the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And, this, and so they had all the individuals from all over the place. He was just wanting to show off. And it says in the next verse, when the days were completed, what did he do? After 180 days of a huge feast, what's the next thing he did? Another feast <laughs> that lasted seven days. But this one was only for those in the city. All the people of the city, probably all the poorer people or anybody that wanted to, they got to participate in this one. The other one was probably more of a political thing where he's trying to show off his riches, his wealth, all this kind of thing. But here it says it was for everybody who was in the kingdom. <clears throat> and that's talking specifically in Shushan, the citadel. It says from great to small. And he had the... the Feast in the court of the gardens of the garden of the king's palace. Describes how it was made up and everything. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver on, the mosa on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. Interesting thing that says in here. One quick word. <clears throat> Can you envision this, what it looks like in this garden right now? Do you, are you imagining beds? It mentions couches. All these people, this, this party's going on for seven days. <laughs> and some may have come out, come out of town, just happened to be there. They, want, they needed some, and basically they were sleeping there. It was a huge garden, evidently. Well, we know about the Babylonian gardens, how famous they were and, and large. Well, same kind of situation here, evidently. Um, and it says, interesting, in verse 7, And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance. What does that mean? What does that tell you? Royal wine in abundance. Hmm? The king brought out his best stuff. The royal wine, that was his. Because it, it mentions that it was the king's wine. Based according to his generosity. So he tapped his own cellars and, and brought out the best stuff just for the people of the city there. And only those in the, in the city at that time got to be a part of that. Verse 7 uh, in verse 8, I mean, it was an interesting concept here. In accordance with the law, 
the drinking was not compulsory. In most situations, if the king is drinking, what does everybody else have to be doing? They got to make the king happy. The king doesn't want to do everything by himself. But according to Persian law, or at least under this king, possibly, because it says, in accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. So, you ever been to somewhere and alcohol's being served? A work party or something along that line? Uh, and you feel uncomfortable because you don't want to drink? I mean, I've never felt uncomfortable. I've just said, no, I don't drink. It doesn't matter what they have to say or what they want to say. That's my choice. And many times, and my dad, had, as I was growing up, he talked about a situation when him and my mom went to a, an office party. And they, they met him at the door, and they decided, okay, they, they offered him a drink. And they just said, we don't drink. And he said, well, can I get you a Pepsi or something? And they got him a Pepsi. And they said, the next time there was a party there, my parents came and said, well, the sodas are right over here at this place. Then they changed the way they did things. Can, you, can we affect people just by taking a stand, that, a little stand like that? And that's what God wants us to do. The little things like that that we can do that have an impact on others. <clears throat> so we get into the queen now. Verse 9. Queen Vashti, she had a feast also going on. And who was her feast for? All the women. So we had boy-girl parties <laughs> going on. Uh, males in one place, the females in another. It says that she had it in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, last day of this party, of this feast... It says, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. <laughs> well, evidently that means he is drunk. <laughs> After drinking for seven days <laughs> straight, the best wine, he was drunk. As well as evidently most of the others were too. In the next part of this verse, I, I, I look at it. He commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abaktha, Sethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs, to go to do what? Bring who? Bring the queen. Bring the queen Vashti in. Send seven men to bring how many women? One. <laughs> to the king. Why did, why did the king want her there? Yep, show her off. Um, <clears throat> to bring Queen Vashti, 11, before the king, wearing her royal crown, in order to show her, show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. What did the king tell the queen to wear? What was she supposed to wear? Royal crown. Do you ever think about it? And then in terminology, that was all he wanted her to wear. According even to some footnotes in Josephus' history, it's even mentioned in that way. That it, you have to read the subtext there. If you look at that and you just think, well, she's just going to come in dressed, but she has to wear a crown. The king wanted to show her body off. Wanted to, I mean, denigrate the queen to bring her down. Of course, he was just proud. He was also drunk. So in this situation, Vashti had a choice to make, didn't she? Verse 12, what was her choice? No. <laughs> she refused take part in this, what he was wanting to do. Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. 
Now we'll see a little bit later, we know for a fact, because of this attitude and the way it describes him here, he was intoxicated. Because later on, when he evidently uh, sobered up, he wasn't real happy about what he had done. He had made a decision and did something, and he had to deal with the consequences of it after that. <clears throat> so, the king was furious and his anger burned with him. So who did the king turn to? Good, I'm glad Tim's not here tonight. <laughs> he turned to his lawyers. <laughs> you look at these here. Verse 14, I said verse 13, he says that to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice. Those closest to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marsena, and Mamukhan, the seven princes of Persia and Media. But the interesting thing is that you look back on there, they were the ones who were supposed to be the experts on law and justice. What does that mean to you? Someone who's there, who the king is turning to for law and justice. Whose law and justice are they concerned about? Whatever the king wants. Now, you understand, I think it's been discussed before, Persian rules, Persian law, once a law was put into effect... Could that law ever be changed? Could it be repealed? No. A law made was done. And that's part of what we see here and even can see. There are ways of getting around that law, the laws, though, as it happens at the end of this book. But it was still a, a second law was made so that something different could happen in order to circumvent what the first law that was put out there on. <clears throat> Sounds like tax laws that I have to deal with all year long. It's, that's just <laughs> happening constantly. So I understand this kind of stuff that works. Uh, these seven guys, they had the access to the king's presence, and they ranked highest in the kingdom. And they came and they said, what shall we do to Queen Vashti? According to, to, according to law, because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. What do you do? What would a normal, if it had not been the queen, and they refused to do what the king wanted, what would have been done? Probably put to death. Um... But the queen, he really did love her. But evidently not when he was drunk. <clears throat> so, Memucan, verse 16, answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces, provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report queen, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. Beginning of women's lib? <laughs> yeah. And a dominant society of males that decided that they wanted to rule how they wanted and wanted things. Queen Vashti is an historical, as I've read and looked on things and uh, encyclopedia stuff on the internet and everything, she's looked at as the beginnings of women's rights. Stepping into that point. Did God have rights for women? Did he instill them from the beginning? Yes. Was there a difference between men and women and, and the way God wanted them from Adam and Eve? Yes. But at no time was it supposed to be this kind of a relationship to ask somebody to do something that was immodest, immoral, and then punish them for it. You look at the same king that had this thing where, well, they, those people don't have to drink. 
But if my wife doesn't come out here, the queen doesn't come out here wearing nothing but a crown, she's in trouble. No, I'm, I'm sure it isn't. <laughs> in the, in not, and probably in many other kingdoms and other things, this is where the Bible tells us about a situation. That it stood. Women had stepped up in many places of honor. Some of them not even Jewish. And we don't assume that Vashti is Jewish, Jewish either. Uh, because that's why the next queen of this, this book and everything is Jewish and has to hide that from everybody. <clears throat> but it is uh, pointed out historically in most historical books, this is an early comment on women having to find some kind of rights to take care of themselves or just a way of being treated in that way. King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. But this very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered that Vashti shall come no more before the king, before king Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree which he will make is proclaimed throughout all the empire, for it, he, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. So these lawyers told the king what they thought he should do. What did the king think about it? He was pleased. In the next verse, and the reply pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Mamukan. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. Now, if we looked historically, if we looked at some of the other, when we look reading Ezra and Nehemiah and seeing that the Persians were lenient in so many ways with people that they had conquered, allowing them to continue to worship as they had before. The fact that they were able to, as in this situation, speak in the language of their own people. Um, each man should be the master of his own ha house. Did God not institute a male head of the household from day one? All right, not day one, really. I would say Adam and Eve were equals. But upon sin, did God create a hierarchy in the family? Yes? Okay. Yes, he did. And it was based on the woman sinned first. And God put this in it. Does it mean that they're supposed to be, the husband is to force the wife to do things that are ungodly? No. God had, did not have that plan in there at all. Instead, as we see in the New Testament, we're told that God, the, the husband is to treat the wife as a precious vessel. The way the king treated Vashti here is not a precious vessel. A precious thing is what he was treating her as. <clears throat> and he lost her in this because of it and because of the situation that happened. In chapter 2, there's where things start heating up here a little bit. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, what did he remember? He remembered Vashti. He remembered the queen. So what is that? How do you read between the lines and what it says when the, his, when the wrath subsided? What else had happened? He sobered up. <laughs> he was no longer drunk. <laughs> Did he not make those choices when he had been intoxicated for seven days? Yeah. <clears throat> so from reading that, it makes it look like 
part of him is sad that he did that. I mean, it's, that's something that he chose to do. But now he had, he's stuck with it. He put a law out. He can't change that law. So he decided he, the next step had to be done. The king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins who be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers to all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the custody of Hegai. I guess that's how you pronounce it. That's the way I'm pronouncing it. Um, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now, we've, most of us have grown up in church. We've studied the story of Esther as kids, even. <clears throat> How long was this choice, this process of choosing? How long did it take? Anybody take a guess? That, a year is going to show up in here in a, in a spot, but it was four years later. How do we know that? The scriptures tell us that. Back in chapter 1, this whole party took place in the third year of his kingdom. And then when you get to uh, chapter 2, verse 16... It's in the seventh year of his reign. That puts a different perspective on it than I used to think when, until you look at this time frame. That that's why those years are in there, to help us understand. So this whole process of getting the new queen, he had no queen for four years. Did he have young women to sleep with, evidently? Yes, because of the procedures of the way that they were being tested. They were being tested test drove or whatever in this situation uh, to him, for him to decide who he wanted to be uh, queen. In verse three, verse 5, chapter 2. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. So evidently, this family had been there for a while. Because Nebuchadnezzar, and we've gone through, and you got it, when you think about it, where Xerxes is at this point, there's several generations that have taken place since this Kish had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar. Because you finish up with Nebuchadnezzar, then you know we have Cyrus as the next king in the Persian Empire, his son was a very short time, and then we had Darius, and now we're Xerxes. So, or Hazarus, same name. So it's been quite a while that Mordecai has been here, probably grew up, probably was born in this kind of captivity. <clears throat> Describes him then, um, Mordecai had brought up Hadassah. Who's Hadassah? That's, that's her Jewish name. That's her real name. We know it's interesting that the Bible uses not her Jewish name. Right? It's the book of Esther. It's not the book of Hadassah. Evidently, she grew up knowing Esther more. Maybe the parents gave her the Jewish name according to their custom. And maybe she was given the Esther, which is considered a Persian name, which means morning star. And it was supposed to be that was, and that's what she became known for, because as queen, that's what she was known as. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Esther has a lineage of Jewish that goes back. It says, Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So what relationship does that say? Cousin. Cousin. Uh, you think they're the same age? No, just by the basics of 
he brought her up. <laughs> what does that mean to you? He raised her. He raised her. He was like a, I think in some places it refers to him like uncle. There's not a conflict in there. That may have been the, the way they presented it at a later time because of the, the relatives and so forth. But this scripture here specifically says they were cousins. And he was much older due to the fact we know he was the one who brought her up and taught her. So what, was she, what do you think she was taught from childhood? Scripture. The Old Testament. She was brought up Jewish. They had to hide it. And sometimes I would think, and sometimes not. Because remember again, the Persians let the people worship how they wanted to be. But in this given situation, I have the feeling the way the book is written if it were known that she was a Jew, what do you think it would have happened? What's that? She wouldn't have been queen. They, she may have been considered unfit. She was a captive. She was, she was a lineage of these people who had been captured. She's not good enough to be queen. So somehow or another in Mordecai raising her, it was never known her Jewish nature. Um, and we know that the fact, again, the Bible says that they were allowed to continue to worship God, their God, the Jews were. But this seems to have been a secret in some way. Interesting dilemma that they had both Esther and Mordecai had to deal with. Uh, and it says that he brought her up. For she had neither father nor mother. So that puts it in the perspective she needed an older, and it happened to be an older relative that was going to raise her. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Hege, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Hege, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him. I'm sorry, now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. Whose favor? Uh-uh. She hadn't seen the king yet. Hege. She pleased him as far as he, he liked her. King is not going to see... Any of the, he's going to see these women at certain times only. And the process we'll look at here, for any of them, before any of them could even be introduced to the, chosen by the king, they had to go through a year of preparation. Which is why, again, this four-year situation took place here. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he... Hege, he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Who, what other Bible characters does this sound like? <clears throat> hmm? Don't know. Someone who went from rags to riches. Who? Joseph. Joseph. There's my bud. <laughs> I knew you'd know, Chuck. Joseph went that way from the, being in prison to becoming the second po most powerful man, person, in Egypt. How'd that happen? Providence of God. That's what this whole book is really about. And that, keep that in your mind as we read here. You'll see so many different times that it is showing. The prov God's, God's never mentioned, but can you not see the providence of God in this book? In every single place. You can see it throughout the entire Bible. But in this book where God is not mentioned, we see how God interacts in our lives. <clears throat> Verse 10. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Smart choice. That's the best thing he could do for her right then. 
And every day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's health, welfare and what was happening to her. If he raised her like a daughter, you think as a parent, you wouldn't be concerned with your child in this kind of dangerous environment? You just got through seeing what happened to Queen Vashti. Vashti. How is it? Vashti or Vashti? Or both? <laughs> whichever way you want to. Um, never did remember exactly which one. So then here in verse 12, each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after what? She had completed 12 months preparation. And that preparation... It's strange to me. You think, okay, is there going to be education so that she's smarter? She learns what the laws are. She has to learn all this kind of stuff. No. <laughs> if this is the only thing, for there were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. That was how they were training up a queen. And it goes back to show why Ahasuerus had the attitude he did about Vashti. All they did, they honored beauty. They wanted beauty. If that's all the training that, or anything they had that, to treat to make a woman eligible to be queen, it's kind of not real smart. It's not, it just doesn't seem consense. And it says there, thus, prepar thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody, custody of Shajgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. This is totally not common to our concepts of a husband and wife situation. It is <clears throat> so foreign to our society, our rules, the way we are. Now, other countries, I'm sure, have similar types of situations like this. But it doesn't fit in our mindset in this way. Is now verse 15. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Ahipahel, the, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's unit, eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. Why is this verse in here? What's that telling us about Esther? What's that? She was paying attention. And she was also not choosing to honor herself by giving the authority of what she would take to the head eunuch, the one in charge of the women. Did he not even trust her that much more? Because it talks, if, he had, if they had brought her in here, they, they set her aside separately. She wasn't being trained yet for queen, I don't think. Because she's been here four years. And if they do all the training just the year before they may get chosen, I don't know. We, we don't know all that. But anyway, we know here in this situation, <clears throat> she had developed a relationship with the head eunuch, the one in charge of the women, to the point she trusted him. And he trusted her. She was something different to him, right? As the scripture says. So she's only going to take whatever he says he advises her to take. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Is that talking about beauty? Probably so. Or is the saw her meaning all those who were ever around her? Because if she's just replacing Vashti, who was supposed to be not down gorgeous, and now Esther comes around, how do we look at that as 
I guess the people there, if that's all they wanted was outside physical beauty, very shallow. But we see here also that Esther stood out in different ways because of the way she re, uh, communicated, the way she interacted with the Persians, especially those like the head eunuch kind of thing, the way that relationship, that was built not just because of her beauty, it was built because of who she was, how Mordecai had raised her and taught her to be. So it says she was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the, in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made what? Another great feast. They had a lot of food to prepare. They were having a lot of feasts, it seems like. The Feast of Esther. <laughs> For all the officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. Do we see a lot of wealth here when we read this, these first couple of chapters? How much wealth this king had? Understand historically, at this point in time, it's, it's about at its largest uh, land area that the Persian, Medo-Persian or Persian kingdom was. It had conquered. Each king before them had conquered a section, and the next king that came along conquered more and more. Each of the, second, the next generations that came. So this point right now, Ahasuerus, who is the king here, he was the last of the Persian kings who, were, who tried to go over and conquer Greece and failed like the other ones before, like his father before him. None of them were able to ever conquer Greece. And so Ahasuerus ended up conquering some other areas of land, but he still couldn't do what any of the other before him could do either. They couldn't do it, so he failed. But evidently they had conquered enough where their wealth was astronomical. It was huge. Because you got to figure, if they, they knocked off the Babylonians, and the Babylonians had knocked off Jerusalem, and they took all the, the gold and all the stuff, in, in, increments and instruments and stuff in the temple. They took all that from every kingdom that they went, every major city, and brought it back. And then when the Medo-Persian Empire conquered the Babylonians, they got all those things back. And what did they do with most of those implements those religious things that they had taken from the people they conquered. They turned it back to them. They gave it back to them. We talked about that earlier in this quarter. They were given back to them. The Persians allowed all their captivities to worship however they want to. As long as it didn't interfere or contrast with the Persians for the most part. Like the Romans. That's what they learned, how to make sure you want to gain the happiness of the people. Well, you let them, you give them a the little bit of freedom that they can have. You're right, the Romans, when they conquered all this territory, what did they do with the Jewish faith? They let them continue to, to do all their holidays, all their feast days, all the, the things, that, as long as they just paid tribute. That was the important thing to these kings. As long as the money kept coming in, they were left alone. So we have the generosity of the king. Now, the last little bit here of this chapter is the story of setting up what happens later. This is not a long book. It's not eight chapters or nine, ten chapters. Oh, ten chapters. So it's not a long book. <clears throat> Interesting story. You're, it's good if you can get a chance even before next week, before Dan comes back. Read the book through. And that way then and read it through again. It's, it's interesting because you have to find all the pieces at different places that come together. Because 
if you're just waiting till ne next week to start looking at it again, you're going to forget some of the details that we looked at today, and it helps to just to make it all fit together. Because me, it's fascinating as I study the Bible, and the historicity of all, all the things that are taking place and how it's proved through so many proofs, as well as to see God's plans. If we see the plans here, that's, that's all this, this Bible is God's plan for our salvation. And he started this plan from Genesis, and he had it in place and set to go throughout all this time until the time Jesus came and died for us. When the virgins, in verse 19, when the virgins were gathered together a second time, um, I'm just looking at this, okay. Mordecai sat within the king's gate. What was Mordecai's job? What? Well, that was his choice to raise her, but that wasn't his job. I don't think he's getting paid to do that. Do we find anywhere in the book of Esther what he did for a living? No, we don't. <clears throat> By the fact that he's sitting out here, does he, what does he look like possibly? A beggar? Someone who's out of work but asking for help in the situation? <clears throat> His main goal of sitting out there was for what, though? He was, want, he was checking on Esther. He wanted to know how she was doing. That's what it says here. Esther had not revealed her family or her people and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. See, a father-daughter relationship there. That's, that's pretty much what that is. She related to him in that way. And we see it later on in the book, too. In those days, when, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai. So Mordecai's out there on the streets, and he's picking up on all the gossip. He knows what's happening around there. They look at him as being, all the people, I mean, all the Persians, they look at him as being just insignificant, and they overlook him. They see a beggar every day out in the same place. They're not going to even think about him. He's just part of the background scenery. But it says the matter became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Esther gave Mordecai the credit. And what happened then? And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Why is this information in here? Doesn't this not come out? <laughs> this is an important few verses here. Because this is laying the groundwork for something that's going to happen later in this book. Something happened. Mordecai stepped up because he saw some wrong that would be done. The only one that he knew that had any power was Esther. Esther talked to the king. It was checked into. An inquiry was made. It wasn't just a rush to justice or anything like that. They checked things out, I'm sure. And when they found out that these two had, were planning to kill the king or doing in that situation, they, Mordecai got the credit. And it's interesting because this book of the Chronicles, they kept very extensive diaries or chronicles of what took place. The king wanted to know who had done well for them. They wanted to know who had done things against them. Most of the time, that didn't take as much space because if they did something against them, like these two guys did, they were killed. No problems anymore. But those who did something good for the king, from you see, and you see the way that this king had 180 days of feast for all the people and then another seven special days for those who were just in his kingdom, he was, he was the type that liked to honor and to reward people. 
and his and Mordecai's name in this book of the Chronicles of the King is something that was important. Because it's interesting that later on in this book, those of you who know the book of Esther well, it's kind of like he had a sleepless night and he needed something to read. Or actually, he was, someone was reading it to him. But he, uh, this story got brought up. Now, it make, when you think about that, we don't know the length of time, but there must have been a whole lot of things that were going in those books that he couldn't even remember this guy who had saved his life because he'd forgotten, oh, I forgot to reward this guy. And we'll see that later in the book here. Any other questions or any comments about these two chapters? Well, appreciate your attention and your attendance. Thank you.